Welcome back to the afternoon sessions. Now let me also take this opportunity to remind you that on this Delft virtual platform, not only can you listen to over 30 hot topics from more than 60 industry speakers, but you can also enjoy the excitement from more than 10 live esports tournaments and show matches. Visit over 30 startup showcases, as well as network of other online industry players and gaming enthusiasts. Once again, we are very grateful for your participation and support from our partners, including Adidas, and Cinox as our rewards partner, and Universal Production Music as our music partner, as well as our supporting organization towards Dell this year. Adding to the excitement, don't forget to check out the rewards page to win fabulous prizes after completing missions on the virtual platform. Without further ado, let's kickstart our afternoon sessions with an expert dialogue on blockchain gaming, the future of work as playing games. We are very honored to have Mr. Yat Su, co-founder and chairman of Emoka Brands, founder and CEO of Blaze, Mr. Galen Law Kun, PwC crypto team, to share their insights on the future of blockchain gaming. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yat and Galen. All right, thank you very much for joining uh, Yatsu. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm very excited to be talking about the future of NFTs as well as the rise of tokenized the gaming as well as the future of the blockchain, especially within uh, the gaming industry today. So maybe let's tell me more about yourself and you know, how you started and you know, what you work on these days. Yeah, so thanks, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, maybe I'll just, you know, um, talk a little bit about sort of how we got into the whole blockchain gaming yeah. space as a background. Uh, I mean, I myself have been in Hong Kong for a long time, and we started one of Hong Kong's first ISPs called Hong Kong Online. Uh, we started Outplace, which was a, a, like probably one of the largest email service providers, um, one of probably the first tenants at the Cyroport, yeah. uh, which was then sold to IBM. But anyway, fast forward, we got into blockchain gaming because uh, we were actually in the middle of acquiring a studio in Vancouver, that happened to share an office with uh, a company called Axum Zen and was working with them to build a product called CryptoKitties. And for those who don't know, CryptoKitties was actually the very first blockchain game and pretty much invented the NFT ERC721 standard. Uh, and you know, it was kind of a science experiment. Nobody expected that it would do what it did, but it went on to sell over $30 million worth of kitties. Uh, it brought Ethereum as a network on its knees because everyone was just trading cats. Uh, it was kind of a crazy time. Uh, but really, what we discovered is that the same technology that makes sort of Bitcoin and, and Ethereum permanent and valuable can actually be used for digital assets. And for us, that's kind of when the penny dropped. That's when we said, wait a second, this is what I, as a gamer, always wanted, which is to truly own my gaming assets independently. Right? Uh, and as a result, you know, we came to an arrangement we became shareholders in Dapper Labs, which was basically the uh, you know, grandfather of uh, the NFT movement, you could say. We became distributors of CryptoKitties, you know, literally like a month or a month and a half after it launched. Uh, and the co-founder, uh, well, the founder of the business that we were acquiring became a co-founder of CryptoKitties and also involved with us. So we have a tight relationship with the team. Uh, and that's how we started uh, getting into the space. And you know, this was in early 2018 at this point. Nice. Uh, that, at that point, the industry was still in its infancy and now has become a pretty significant business already. And I can definitely see that. And from 2017, when I first bought my first crypto kitty, uh, until now we've seen uh, many, many different types of companies coming out with their, uh, either their layer one protocol, so Draft Labs coming out with uh, Flow, their own blockchain. Yes. Uh, to solve the scalability issues that they experienced in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also seen other companies such as the Sand Token, uh, Axis Infinity, mm -hmm. coming out, you know, the NFTs on the Ethereum network. Yeah. How do you see uh, future blockchain companies, especially gaming companies in particular, um, coming out with their own types of projects and products? Do you see layer one to be a much more viable option or do you think building on Ethereum will continue to be the prevailing trend? So I think uh, when it comes down to, let me, let me talk a little bit about the connection between I think where we think gaming and blockchain comes in really handy. Uh, and that's because most people, even though we all look at the price of Bitcoin and we say, hey, wow, it's going up and it's exciting. I think people need to understand there's still only about 50 million people just 50 million people 
who are in the cryptoverse, right? That is a very small number. Yeah. Right? I mean, we have like, you know, billions of people online, right? So really the prize that we're all trying to build here is not around how do we service 50 million people. It's about how do we bring billion of pe billions of people into blockchain because of the promise that blockchain offers, which is all the benefits of the governance and, and sort of uh, and, and, and the provenance that we can see with virtual digital assets. And so the connection between gamers is exciting because all gamers who play games today, which is 2.6 billion of them, actually understand virtual currency. They actually understand this. And they also understand virtual assets because what are they buying in their games? All virtual assets, except they don't really own them. Yeah. Right, so that's, that's where the connection comes in. And so we think actually gaming will effectively supercharge the blockchain industry. Uh, and you know, they will be the ones that bring mass adoption to blockchain. It's the gamers. Now, that comes into your question in relation to scalability. We have seen with Ethereum that you know, as an on-chain solution, it can handle it. But what we have to also consider is that the safety of that network comes from the millions of nodes that are out there. Right? And therefore, that is how you prove that the virtual asset is really yours. Because you don't have a central authority saying you own it. Yeah. You have millions of people out in the world in a distributed network, a distributed ledger, proving it's yours. Yeah. And that's important. But the broader the network becomes, frankly, there is a cost. Right? And I liken this example of kind of like, uh, like a Fort Knox. Right? If you want to keep your assets in the most valuable and most protected place, there is a cost. Right? If you have an expensive painting, are you just going to put it in your house, or do you want to put it in a vault? Right? Do you want to put it somewhere safe? Right? So if you want to put it somewhere safe, you put it in Ethereum. If you want to put it somewhere less safe, you can go either with a side chain, like a layer two, or you can go with a new layer one. Uh, and again, you know, while Ethereum, I think, won't go away, I think Ethereum will be the primary value chain for all of this, I do think that there is a role to play for whether it's a side chain or whether it's new layer ones. Yeah. Because again, there's only 50 million people who are using this, right? You know, we have billions of people to onboard. So I think the opportunity is still there for all of them. And the other thing is competitive friction. Right? More people building better solutions enables us to get better technology. And it which brings us to the next point is the proof of ownership. And uh, you probably know me, I'm a huge fan of uh, Clash of Clans. I've been playing for six, seven years, uh, right from the beginning. And I just recall in early 2000, there was this game called Maze Defense, and it's basically a tower defense strategy, and you would build mazes. And uh, one day, the founder says, oh, look, you know, the database got corrupted. And all the process, all the saved games that I've, I've played were all gone, all wiped out. And this is something that uh, really brings into mind is, you know, when you buy something, on the existing traditional game, such as uh, Clash of Clans. You spend it on the gems. Obviously, it exists right now, but maybe five, 10, 20 years down the line, when the servers are discontinued, all the, th all the progress, the time that you spent are gone. That's right. So the beauty of having uh, NFT tokens is once you buy it, it will always be there. And which brings to your point is, if you build on Ethereum, yes, uh, the, the token's there, but when you talk about other day one solutions that might not have a proven track record, which is what you said, is it, you know, it could be issues with the, the storage of value or if the token disappears because the chain simply, you know, no one is using. So which brings us to where do you see the industry moving in the next six to 12 months? And how do you see gaming companies uh, incorporating blockchain technologies into their day-to-day -day workflow and games? Sure. So maybe just to quickly address the question, the, sort of the point you make about sort of Ethereum versus another chain. You know, we recently had an auction for um, the F1 Monaco track. It sold for the equivalent of 223,000 US dollars. That seems like an enormous amount of money for, you know, an NFT, right? And what I can say though is that if that NFT was sold on another chain, I don't think we could get that kind of money. It's not because when you, decide to work with the chain, you're not only just using the technology, yeah. you're accessing the community, right? And I think the way to look at chains is like, it's in a broad macro way is, I think of a chain almost like a country, right? Yeah. 
you know, maybe you sell a product in Africa will have a different price than you sell a product in China or in Japan or in America. It's kind of the same thing. You're tapping into a community and into that infrastructure. Uh, now, in the future, what we believe is that blockchain gaming, and of course we won't call it blockchain gaming. It's kind of a little bit like calling it internet or TCP IP gaming, right? Like that doesn't make sense, right? But in the future of this sort of uh, blockchain gaming universe, what we're really doing and what the industry is trying to do is to create real property rights for the assets that you have. And what that means is that when you develop true property rights, all of the innovation around true property ownership comes to bear, which is like financial services, which is, you know, whether it's rental products or it's leasing or it's buying, all that kind of stuff, all starts coming in because you have the banking services effectively you can do. Uh, and that, I think, will provide a, an environment where game companies themselves can provide and, and leverage the growth of their communities. Yes. Now, as a game company, I think uh, most game companies do not understand blockchain for one simple reason. They are like feudal kingdoms. They themselves run the show, right? Yeah. And when you go, let's say for instance like Supercell, the makers of, of, uh, of, of Clash Royale or Clash of Clans, right? Uh, why should they give up power? Why should they sell assets and then have the community say, tell them what to do, right? I don't know any kingdom in the world that willingly gave up its empire, right? The pressure came from the players, or in, our, in the historical sense, from its citizens, right? Who demanded more liberty or more rights or more equality, whatever it was, they demanded it. And of course, the community broadly improved because free trade, you know, more merchant opportunities, more income, um, you know, all those things, you know, you know, capitalism was able to flourish, but it was not possible uh, when it was a dictatorship, effectively. And that is exactly what's happening in the game worlds. They run everything, right? Uh, and if they want to shut down, like, you know, you want, I don't want to, I, I just, you don't own anything anymore, or I delete the game, tough luck, right? And we think that gamers will always choose uh, to play a game where they own everything in the future yeah. than not. And so we think the game industry won't willingly move there. It will be maybe some pioneering companies like ourselves and others that push it there but the consumer will make the choice. Yeah. And I think game companies will have no choice but to go into that eventually. Yeah, and which uh, leads us to the next point is uh, what you guys are working on right now. And I've seen you guys are coming out with much more games uh, in terms of like your, the tokens, the types of cars, the types of customization. Maybe tell, uh, tell the audience more about what you guys are working on and, um, and you know, what are the next steps you guys sure. have. I mean, I think uh, one of our highest profile projects in the blockchain space is Sandbox, yeah. which is basically kind of like a Minecraft but on a blockchain, where people are making their assets as NFTs. Yeah. Um, we did list a token, right? Um, and uh, that token trades quite, quite strongly. But what we discovered when we did that is that it wasn't just the token mechanism uh, for capital. It created a huge audience of new users who got to learn about the product, right? Yeah. So in that sense, lo uh, launching a token, your game currency, as it were, is actually a marketing event as well. Right? Um, but then also, I think one of our more high-profile projects is F1 Delta Time. Yeah. Uh, we issued the Rev token on this one. F1 Delta Time is the official license uh, game for Formula One, uh, Formula yeah. E as well, uh, with, with, uh, with Rev and uh, MotoGP. And there, it's kind of like eSports. We now have many eSports sort of companies and individuals setting up, racing against themselves, uh, and building and buying these parts. And, uh, and, and I think what we see here is that this idea of ownership is so exciting for people because yeah. they can not only buy the assets and play them in the game, they can also take them somewhere else. Yeah. Um, the value of these cars and assets have appreciated, but they haven't appreciated because the game design mechanism was built that way. It's because the demand of the assets increased yeah. because more players wanted to get to move into the, to, to that. And, and so, so we see that benefit the players themselves who also, if they were early in the environment or early in the game and they are supporting it, yeah. then they can see the assets that they've developed appreciate. Yeah. And that's actually not that different from the real world, right? In the real world as well, you know, if you were an early real estate investor in Hong Kong and you were developing it, you would also see it appreciate. And the, the most important thing is that once the community owns a part of the asset, it has an incentive to make it work. Of course. Right? Vested interest. Vested interest, yeah. 
And on a parting note is, you know, there are certainly a lot of issues with NFTs and gaming these days. And I think personally, one of the biggest issues is the usability. Uh, people don't know how to buy the crypto in order to buy the NFT. You have to use a wallet, you need to use a ledger or you use a MetaMask. And all of these different issues that are major stumbling blocks in the adoption of NFT and blockchain gaming. Uh, what else do you see in the foreseeable future? Maybe regulate, regulatory issues? Um, how do you see this uh, in, you know, developing? And what issues or solutions are you guys working on? So there's multiple questions here, right? <clears throat> the first one is in regards to adoption and sort of how to make the process easier. So I kind of liken the example of what you're describing as the early internet days. You know, for those of you, you know, probably most people watching are probably too young to remember, but I used to dial up with a modem an acoustic coupler, and it was a horrible experience. But still, you know, millions of people went online uh, going through that very manual approach. Um, you know, you had to buy a modem, you had to have a phone line, you had to do all that stuff to get online. And then you went on the, on, on the web, the early version of the internet, and you go, eh, that's not that exciting, right? Uh, and to a certain extent, that's where blockchain finds itself at the moment. Uh, but at the end of the day, we went there because we saw something of value. And I think that's the same thing. People don't use the internet because the internet. They use the internet because there is a valuable experience that is worth their while. Yeah. And the same is true here for blockchain and blockchain gaming. So what we need to do is first demonstrate that what you're doing with your assets in game have value. So if I'm playing a game and I have things that become valuable, and then I have a way of maybe trading it or giving it to someone else or transferring it, that is the process where they would then transfer truly onto blockchain, we think, right? It's, it's like a little bit like, you know, if you don't have a bank account and, you know, you get your first check, yeah. you will wait in a bank account for, I don't know, hours, and you will sign everything so you can cash in your check. So we think that is a conversion process. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's the first point. The second question in regards to regulation is that because real value and real money is involved, there is going to be certain elements of regulation that's already taking place. Like right now, all of our projects, they have legal opinions, they have to go reviews. Um, you know, the exchanges themselves are also being more cautious around this. You know, you have to make distinctions between a utility token versus a security token. Yeah. These are all things that are super relevant, right? Uh, so so we, are, we are the same. Yeah. And of course, do we expect the rules to mature? Yes, but for instance, already there's been many inclinations and discussions with the regulators around the world that NFTs would not be considered a security because they are independent assets, they're scarce, right? Um, whereas fungible tokens may be a little bit different, right? Yes. So these are parts that are being discussed at the moment. Uh, and I think also if the utility is clear, as we have seen right now, uh, then it, it should not be an issue because it's the same as having game currency uh, inside a game right now or like tokens used in an arcade. Yeah, and you know, this reminds me of uh, there was this quote that I read online, and they said, look, you know, when the internet first came out in the early 90s, you know, people will think about, okay, you know, the emails, and then you think about, okay, Amazon selling books, but who would have thought about the different applications such as Instagram, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, and all these different other layers of internet applications on top of the internet? So I think this is the same with uh, blockchain, is initially there's these NFTs, but there's a lot of things that on top of that that we haven't thought about yet. Yes. And this is what makes why you know, uh, blockchain very, very exciting, especially uh, such a new industry too. Yeah, I mean, I think what's super exciting for us here is that really, I th you know, blockchain has enabled a true new economy to come inside the gaming world. And what we're seeing now is that people who play our games are actually making an income, yeah. like a working income. And in some cases, it's thousands of US dollars a month. Yeah. Uh, in other cases, even more. What does that mean? Basically, it means that you know, playing games can become a source of income, yeah. not just in an esports manner, which is only meant for sort of the elite, let's say, of our gamers, but for broadly all the players involved, right? All the time you spend in the game has value now. Of course. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Yatsu. Is, uh, I think this is the end of our session. Uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, we look forward for uh, everyone to join the next session. Thank you very much, Yet and Galen, for the wonderful sharing.